So what do you do if you have half a log that you want to turn into a bowl, but you don't have a bandsaw to first turn it into a round? Now if you've already done some work turning uh, green logs into bowls before, or if you're just getting started looking into uh, how to do that, you probably notice that almost all turners will take the blank to the bandsaw first and turn it into a round before they mount it on the lathe. Um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that, and in fact if you were doing production work, uh, that would be an absolute must. The amount of time you would save by rounding out the blanks first would, end, would mean the money in the bottom line. Uh, but what if you don't have a bandsaw? Or what if, uh, like me, I just don't like to set up the bandsaw for one or two blanks uh, just to round them out. Uh, in fact, I rarely take uh, blanks, uh, logs like this to the bandsaw to round them out first. I usually just mount them directly on the lathe. So how do you go about doing that? How do you go about turning this into a round on the lathe? And the way I'm going to do that, I'm going to mount this log on the lathe just like this, just as it is. And I'm going to turn it round using a special cut, a special roughing cut uh, that I call a pivoting cut. Now this is a nine inch log uh, and I haven't nipped up the corners or anything like that. Um, I would say if you're going to be doing this for, for the first time or if you're not used to cutting a lot of air, um, you want to start with something a little bit smaller, maybe six inches. Um, or uh, if you have electric, an electric chainsaw or perhaps when you're already cutting these into from logs, is you can cut off the corners. So basically you want to you want to scribe out the size bowl you're going to get out of this and then you can nip off these corners uh, with a chainsaw and that'll make the that'll make the work a little bit easier. If you know you're going to be making a conventional bowl you can also nip off this piece right here. It'll be even closer to being round. But I found I've done this so much uh, I've been doing this for so long um, that I usually don't bother even cutting off the corners anymore. Um, but start small, start cutting off the corners, start with a small piece just to see what this is going to feel like, and then work up. If you find that you're pretty good at doing this roughing cut, you can go up to 12, 14 inches in a bowl and then nip those corners off right with this cut. As far as mounting half logs like this on the lathe, uh, I usually use one of two methods. I really like to use screw chucks, and so if the log itself the half log is fairly well balanced like this one is um, and I did a pretty good job of slicing it when I split the log in half so this surface is relatively flat. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and use a screw chuck but I'm going to use the tailstock support until it's completely round. Once it's round I can pull this tailstock away and be comfortable that it's secure. Uh, so I need a... My screw chuck requires a 560 hole. Now the other way that I'll use if you're not comfortable using screw chucks, um, or if I have something that's unbalanced or I don't feel comfortable with the screw chuck, I'll go with a faceplate and that's going to give the ultimate um, security when mounting this. Uh, when I do crotches, crotches are notoriously out of balance and so I'll always go with a faceplate if I'm going to do uh, rough out a crotch. Now the big challenge in trying to rough out something like this in the lathe is there's not much material. It's very hard to rub, to, to ride the bevel uh, using a normal cross end crane cut. You could, you could do it if you were, were steady hand enough, um, but this is going to be traveling fairly slowly. You're going to be at first only ha cutting about 98% you know, air. Um, it's very easy at that slow speed uh, to to bump the tool, have it come into the void and get slammed down. Um, so what I do with this pivoting cut, and you'll see why it's called a pivoting cut in just a second, is that I don't use bevel support. Um, but because I don't have bevel support, uh, that means I have to have some other means of controlling the cut. And so what I do is I put the tool on the tool rest and I use a pivot point. And what that's going to do for me, that pivot point is going to be how I'm going to control the cut. And because I have so much handle on this side of the pivot, and I only have maybe one to three inches on the other side, very little, a lot of movement in the handle 
accounts for very little movement at the uh, cutting edge and so that's how I'm going to get my control. Now this is never going to be as good as using a bevel uh, riding cut uh, but then this is just a rubbing cut. All I really want to do is remove material um, and get this into a round state um, and don't really care what it looks like. Now when I first learned this cut I kind of learned this cut, I believe I was watching a Richard Raffin video, and I don't remember if he was doing exactly this cut or he was doing something similar. Um, but the way I first learned it was to use a lot of down pressure on the tool and use the contact on the tool rest as the pivot point. But what I find, what I found with this is that after a while you can get fatigued, you have to really push down pretty hard to keep the tool from sliding back. So what I kind of evolved to do is instead of, instead of pinning the tool directly to the tool rest, I pin this part of my hand right here, this little bump on my hand. I pin that into the tool rest and then I use my fingers to cradle the tool and that my fingers become the pivot. Uh, I find this much less fatiguing. Also, you will get bumps from time to time, and those bumps will push out. And using your fingers gives a little bit more shock absorbing. It's much less fatiguing this way. So probably the most important part of this cut uh, is to make sure your bowl gouge has the right attitude. Uh, we want the bottom wing to be horizontal. Uh, as you get a little bit better with the cut, you can turn it up a little bit. That'll speed up the cut a little bit. But for start, you want to have that lower wing uh, perfectly horizontal. And then, uh, keeping that same attitude with the flute, you're going to drop the handle a lot. Uh, so the flute is still horizontal, it's just facing uphill at this point. So flute horizontal, and then drop the handle really, really low. All right, I have my tool on the tool rest. Uh, my lower, bo my bottom flute is horizontal. I'm dropping the tool. I'm even keeping this uh, extra long handle right in my hip. I've got my palm on the tool rest. I'm cradling the tool with my fingers. There's my pivot point. And notice that I'm going to be using my whole body uh, to move the tool. Um, that's going to give me just that much more control. Um, and you can see what's happening now is the tip of that tool is making little arcing motions. And so when I, second most important thing probably when you're doing this cut is you want to start with a tool so it's not making contact and as you rotate, as you rotate, as you pivot it starts making contact, you're engaging the wood, it's cutting, it's cutting and it will stop cutting. At that point you take away the tool, you find a new spot and start over. So you got another pivot point and you start arcing, cut, 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 it stops cutting and you just keep repeating that process until this becomes round enough that you can go back to the usual uh, cross end grain cut. Now the other thing I need to mention too is that you always want to make this cut from right to left so that you're going with the grain. Uh, so you may be coming straight across this way, that's okay. You may be coming at a 45, that's okay. You may be over here uh, cutting on face grain, going from right to left, that's okay. Uh, but you don't want to be coming this direction because now you're going to be going directly into end grain and that's going to make it a very brutal cut. Could even get a, a leverage catch and cause really bad things to happen. All right, it's the moment of truth. Let's see how this works. I'm gonna give it one more spin, make sure I'm not hitting the tool rest anywhere. I like the tool rest kind of low on this cut. And I'm gonna bring up the speed very slowly. Um, just make sure my lathe doesn't start bouncing around. Probably only be gonna get maybe 300, 400 RPMs initially. That's about 400 right there, and I can feel my lathe is bouncing around a little bit. And here we go. So I'm, I'm looking at the shadow to make sure I don't put the tool right into the wood. So I have the um, tool and tool rest, horizontal flute, palm on the rest, hook it, hook the uh, tool or cradle the tool with my finger for my pivot point, and my handle is in my hip. And I'm just going to arc right through. And my camera's in the way, I have to move that. That's better. And so I'm gonna pick a new spot, being careful not to stick the tool right into the wood. And once again,
start to take material off, I keep trying to inch up the speed as much as I can. The faster that I can get this turning, the quicker the cuts will go. I'm up to 600 RPMs, it should start speeding up a little bit. So wet, there's water spraying everywhere. So now it's fairly round, still got a little bit more here, but I've got enough speed now. I can get up to about 800 RPMs now without the blade bouncing around. So at this point, uh, I can go back to my regular cross end grain cut to, figure, to finish this up. But you can see it didn't take that long to turn this into almost round just using that roughing cut. Uh, so from this point, see, I'm getting about My 800 RPM is right there and everything's pretty, not too wobbly. And so at this point I can go back to regular cross end grain cuts. you guys enjoyed that I'm pretty wet and I got a lot of shavings clean up but that's half the fun of turning green wood uh, having the shavings fly everywhere uh, so that is the roughing cut that I use to rough out blanks uh, to rough out half logs and other bits of logs and green wood directly on the lathe without needing a bandsaw so no bandsaw no problem so if you find if you get a hold of some really green wood uh, go for it get, go ahead and try making some bowls if you haven't done that before it's a lot a lot of fun uh, the other thing I should mention though this cut uh, I only use this on green wood. Um, if you, I tried using it on seasoned wood before, and it just becomes too brutal of a cut. So this cut, uh, only for you, only for green wood, especially if you, if it's a freshly cut log, it'll cut through the, the wood pretty easily. So until next time, I'm Brian Havens, and thanks for watching. Maybe I should have mentioned that if you're going to cut a lot of green wood, you should stock up on WD-40.